Meiosis is ultimately going to result in four daughter cells. These daughter cells would be the gametes, so this would be egg or sperm, depending on whether we're talking about a male or a female. Now these daughter cells are all going to have an unreplicated haploid set of chromosomes. This is because meiosis is a reductive division, and by reductive division, it does cut the number of chromosomes in half. We're also cutting the ploidy in half. So we start with a parent cell that is ultimately diploid, and we end up with daughter cells that are going to be haploid. Additionally, all of these daughter cells that we get are going to be genetically different from each other, so no two will be the same, and they're also going to be different from the parent cell. One of the big reasons why they end up different is due to that crossing over process that we had during prophase one, and crossing over does produce uh, recombinant chromosomes, so new chromosomes that we did not have before. Make sure that you are familiar with the different stages of meiosis and that you will be able to recognize drawings of the stages on the exam. You also want to be able to compare these with the mitosis phases. Now, if we compare and contrast mitosis and meiosis, um, this is an important part of this next test. So in both cases, we are going to start with a parent cell, which is ultimately a somatic cell. Now the location of this somatic cell will vary depending on which process we're actually talking about. If it is mitosis, this somatic cell could be anywhere inside of our bodies. If it is meiosis, then it is going to be in the reproductive tissues. Now additionally, this parent cell, regardless of the process it will go through, is going to go through an initial interphase process. During that interphase, it will replicate or copy all of the chromosomes. This means that the sister chromatids will be genetically identical to each other at the beginning of mitosis and meiosis. Now if we look at the mitosis side of this, in mitosis we are right away going to take those chromosomes, condense them, and then line them up on the metaphase plate, and we do divide once. Now notice in mitosis that although it is a diploid cell, the homologous chromosomes never come together. So we don't worry about lining them up with each other because there is not going to be any crossing over that takes place. And where, where we start with a diploid cell, we end up with two daughter cells that are also going to be diploid. If we look at the meiosis side, meiosis, we do get a pairing of the homologous chromosomes, and that's where that tetrad structure comes from. We then line up the tetrads on the metaphase one plate so that initially we separate the homologous chromosomes. Separation of the homologous chromosomes is what happens in meiosis one. And then this will be followed by a second meiosis where the daughter um, where those daughter cells actually get a separation of the sister chromatids. In the end, we end up with four daughter cells, and these are all four going to be haploid cells. Now if we continue to compare these two processes with each other, the number of times that we replicate or copy the DNA is going to be once regardless of the type of cell division. Now this is going to happen in interphase as we said before, so it will specifically happen during S phase, and then that S phase will be followed by a G2 where everything is going to be double checked and we're going to make sure that we have copied the sister chromatids exactly. So when the cell leaves interphase, there will be genetically identical sister chromatids. There is going to be a difference in the number of cell divisions that occur. In mitosis, there is only one cell division. So basically, we copy once, we divide once. That's what will ultimately allow us to maintain our chromosome number. On the meiosis side, we are going to divide twice. When we divide twice, we will end up with more daughter cells, and it's also going to reduce that chromosome number down because we're gonna copy once, divide twice. In mitosis, there is no pairing up of the homologous chromosomes. They do not have to come together at all, which really means that we never get the tetrad structures. In meiosis, there is definitely synapsis of the homologous chromosomes, 
and this is going to specifically occur during prophase one. So that will occur in preparation for the crossing over process. The number of daughter cells will be different. In mitosis, we will get two. And then in meiosis, we're going to get four. These daughter cells, their composition is also going to vary. So in mitosis, they will all be diploid, just like the original parent cell. And they're all going to be identical in every way to the parent cell. So same number of chromosomes, same number of sets of chromosomes. On the meiosis side, the four daughter cells will each be haploid. And these haploid cells not only have fewer chromosomes than the parent cell, but they all are going to be genetically different from the parent cell, and then also genetically different from each other. So with meiosis, we are getting some variety. The overall role of these processes will be different. With mitosis, we're talking about cell division that's responsible for growth and development and tissue renewal. This is something that is going to occur all throughout our bodies and really all throughout our lifetime as well. It is going to produce ultimately somatic cells. When we're looking at meiosis, meiosis role is really the production of the reproductive cells, which are also called the sex cells or the germ cells or the gametes, basically egg and sperm. So they're the end results here. We do get the genetic variability, which is going to be very important for the natural selection process or for survival of the species. If we continue to move on and really emphasize some of the unique things about meiosis, first off, the synapsis process is something that occurs only during meiosis. This synapsis process is the lining up of the homologous chromosomes with each other. They do become physically connected with each other along their length. When we have synapses occur, these chromosomes are lining up such that they get identical loci across from each other. This is going to be beneficial in the crossing over process because when we cross over and we exchange pieces of the DNA between non-sister chromatids, then we will be able to break in the exact same place and then swap the same loci for each other. This will ensure that no chromosomes are gaining extra information and no chromosomes are going to be actually losing information. So all we're doing when we have crossing over is we're swapping versions of the genes. Keep in mind that this swapping or crossing over is going to result in the production of recombinant chromosomes. So these recombinant chromosomes, these are chromosomes that now have new combinations or new versions of the genes compared to what they had before or compared to what the parent had. Any kind of tetrads is really unique to meiosis. We do see the, the tetrads located on the metaphase plate during meiosis. This is specifically going to be the metaphase one plate. So the tetrads will be the paired up homologous chromosomes the tetra part of the name stands for the four chromatids that they do contain. We never see any kind of tetrads at all during mitosis, let alone located on the metaphase plate. The separation of the homologous chromosomes or the homologs is also unique to meiosis. This separation of the homologs is what enables the reduction in the number of sets of chromosomes. So this will enable us to go from diploid cells down to haploid cells. This will happen during anaphase one. It basically occurs when we pull apart the tetrads. So when those tetrads are pulled apart during anaphase one, basically the two homologous chromosomes are no longer attached to each other. Now the sister chromatids, they will separate later, but it won't be until anaphase two. And when they do separate, it's going to be non-identical sister chromatids that actually pull apart. If we continue to talk about meiosis and we just emphasize some of the genetic variation that is possible during this process, one thing that we haven't really talked about yet is what we call the independent assortment of chromosomes. Independent assortment of chromosomes has to do with the fact that each tetrad is independent of the other tetrads. This means that each tetrad is going to line up on its own on that metaphase one plate 
and we really can't predict how each of those chromosomes will line up. So here in this image we have two different possibilities that could occur when each tetrad lines up independently. And notice that in possibility one, we could get all the blue located on one side and all the red located on one side. That does affect the ultimate outcome that we get in our four gametes. It is also possible that one of those tetrads will be flipped in the other direction. This results in other combinations in our gametes at the end. So we do have some genetic variation just based on the fact that each tetrad is going to line up independently. Now, as the number of chromosomes increases, the number of tetrads increases, and then the number of combinations possible is going to go up as well. So we can estimate this mathematically. The number of possible combinations that you can get when the chromosomes sort independently during meiosis is going to be 2 raised to the n power. So in this example, we're starting with a diploid cell because we have too big and too small. So it is a diploid cell. We can go ahead and write 2 in, and there is ultimately four chromosomes. If we solve for n, n is going to be equal to 2. And then if we plug it into this little equation that we have, it's basically 2 raised to the n, which would be 2 raised to the second power. That is equal then to 4. Notice that we have four different combinations possible from this particular cell. If we go on to look at another example, suppose that you have an organism with 18 chromosomes. So in other words, the diploid number is going to be 18. We want to know how many different gametes will be possible if the chromosomes assort independently. This is no different from the previous one, but notice that if we have 2n equal to 18, we can solve for our n. That means our n is 9. Then if we want to figure out the number of possible combinations, we use this equation where we take 2 raised to the n power. So we take 2 raised to the ninth power, and then if you do that on your calculator, we should come up with an overall answer. Okay, so 2 raised to the n power so 2 raised to the ninth power is going to give us 512 possible combinations. Sorry, 512. Notice that simply going up to a total chromosome number of 18 from 4 significantly increased the number of possible combinations that we can have based on independent assortment. If we think about this with human cells, for a human cell, basically we've got diploid cells that have 46 chromosomes. This means that our haploid number is actually 23, so n equals 23. If you look at the number of possible combinations for a human cell, you're going to take 2 raised to that 23rd power. If you plug that in on your calculator, you'll be surprised by the answer that you come up with. So this is going to come out to basically 8,388,608 combinations possible. That's not an error there. What that is saying is we're going to basically in metaphase one have 23 tetrads that are lining up each independently from each other on that metaphase one plate. Based on the fact that each one of them can turn one way or the other, we do get over 8 million possible combinations. So this means that within one female, just based on independent assortment or random lining up of the tetrads, you would have over 8, 8 million different egg cells produced. So obviously, independent assortment plays a very big role in the genetic variation that we end up with from meiosis. Another type of genetic variation is crossing over, and this is one that we've already discussed. With crossing over, you are producing recombinant chromosomes, and these will be chromosomes that now have different versions of the DNA combined with each other than what you had before. When we have crossing over, we're actually breaking between some two nucleotides, like we see right here, and then exchanging pieces with each other. When you consider the fact that our chromosomes are made up of a hundred million nucleotides or more linked together. 
the chance that we're going to actually break between the same two more than once is pretty slim to none. We want to keep in mind that crossing over does occur between the non-sister chromatids. So these would be very similar chromatids, but not identical to each other. And they do estimate that we have one to three crossover events occur between te each tetrad. Now it's difficult to really put a number on the genetic variation that we get from crossing over because we probably are getting crossing over occurring in a new lo location every single time that it happens because it's just not likely that we're going to be breaking in the exact same place every time. Mutation also accounts for some genetic variation. Mutation is really nothing more than a change in the DNA. Now mutation is really a random event. Generally we think of it as something that's not good, but it can produce um, some unique things that you didn't have before. This mutation can be due to a number of things. We talked about some of those things at the end of chapter 12 and we called them carcinogens. So there are some chemicals that can cause mutations. There are some viruses and bacteria, um, some irradiation, things of that nature. Mutation can happen at any time. So this could happen in somatic cells. It could happen in reproductive cells. It could happen as an error when the DNA is being copied. So in the case of mutation, this can happen with both asexual and sexual reproduction. The first two that we mentioned would be strictly limited to sexual reproduction because with those you need to have the meiosis taking place. The last type of genetic variation or mechanism of genetic variation is going to be random fertilization. And this is more than just say a random male meeting a random female but also a random selection of an egg from one female and a random selection of a sperm cell from one male and then those combining with each other. So all four of these types of genetic variation are possible if we're talking about sexual reproduction. If we're talking about asexual reproduction, it would just be mutation. So we're certainly going to have a lot less variation, if any, if we're talking about asexual reproduction. If we do put some numbers on this genetic variation, if we just go with the independent assortment of chromosomes, which is the easiest one to really put a number on, based on independent assortment of chromosomes, within one female, you're going to have over 8 million eggs possible. Within one male, you're going to have over 8 million sperm possible. So even if you take the same female and the same male, you have over 64 trillion offspring possible. Okay, and this is not counting the crossing over and it's not counting mutation as well. So it is very, very unlikely that you're ever going to end up with two offspring that are going to be identical to each other in any way. And if you keep in mind that some insects, um, some very simple animals, they do produce thousands of offspring even those thousands of offspring are not reaching the 64 trillion number. So even though they're producing a whole bunch of offspring, it's still very, very unlikely that any of those offspring are going to be identical to each other. Just to sum it up, if we talk about why it's all important or what the significance of this genetic variation is, that really is the subject of biology too. And it really all goes back to natural selection and survival of the species. Obviously, this genetic variation is very important because many, if not most, organisms do devote themselves to sexual reproduction, if it is at all possible. Because with, with sexual reproduction, you do get some unique offspring produced, and this is really going to ensure that no matter what type of stress or challenge comes along, there should be some subset of the population that is going to have the genetic composition to actually withstand and survive in that particular situation. So they will then survive to produce the next generation.